Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm talking about why transit mode matters. I was at a conference on the weekend and one of the talks, which, while a good talk, had this one point in it that I strongly disagree with. And the point was that we care too much about transit mode and that transit mode doesn't really matter because, you know, BRTs can carry as much as subways and vice versa. In today's video, I'm going to tell you why this is not a good idea and why it can lead to a lot of really bad outcomes in our transit systems. Before we get started, if you're not already, go follow me on Twitter at rmtransit as well as on Instagram. And consider supporting the channel on Patreon for early access to videos and other special goodies. Now I want to preface this video with the fact that yes, we do sometimes act in the wrong way towards transit mode. There's a lot of romanticism around trams and sometimes buses and metros as well. And this romanticism isn't good. Just because trams look good doesn't mean that they're the solution for every transit problem. And the same can be said for other transit modes. The problem is when this attitude that the mode we choose doesn't matter gets embedded into transit planning, we have some really disastrous potential outcomes or just systems that could be so much better if we had have planned them using a better mode. Now the first obvious example of this issue is in Ottawa where the O-Train LRT, it's really a metro, uses low floor tram style vehicles on a system which in all other regards is a metro system. It has fare gates and it has full grade separation. What's also important to note is that the system does have a pretty high nameplate capacity of 24,000 people per direction per hour, which is similar to a lot of lighter metro systems. The problem comes when you try to operate a tram with a metro style service. Operating trams at high frequency has a lot of problems. For example, the small and not too frequent doors mean that dwell times are a lot longer than they need to be, which is not good when you're trying to maintain a high headway. Another problem is that low floor trams are horrendously inaccessible when they're crowded. While low floor trams are okay when they're not crush loaded, once you get into metro levels of loading, the trams become very difficult to navigate because of the narrow spaces created by the bogies and the car body. Of course as well, low floor trams have a lot of seating, which doesn't make a ton of sense in a metro context when a lot of people are getting on and off frequently and when there's a lot of standees. Perhaps finally, and most notably in Ottawa's case, the doors are not really designed to be fought in the way that most metro system doors are. It's pretty common on a major subway system for people to stick their arm into the doors. Don't do this, it's bad. But again, it's common, and it's something that doesn't get handled very well by light tram doors that swing out and are quite flimsy. This has been a huge problem in Ottawa because all of the door faults have led to a ton of delays and need to repair vehicles. Put it this way, if Ottawa had have used a high floor metro train to achieve the same service, which probably would have had a negligible impact on costs, it would have had higher capacity, more reliability, and critically, more accessibility for people with mobility impairments. What this shows you is that mode truly does matter. If we had have chose a better mode in Ottawa, a massive metro system would have been able to serve a city much better. The next example I wanted to bring up was BART. While it may appear to be a metro system, BART kind of operates like a giant fancy commuter rail system. It has a ton of parkades, poor transit access, and very peaky demand. With this in mind, as well as the fact that a lot of BART is above ground or could be above ground, I think a move to use bi-level trains, while expensive on initial operating costs, would have maximized current day ridership. To put this in perspective, cities in Canada with 50% of the population of the Bay Area and smaller transit systems are able to carry much more riders because they more optimally use their existing infrastructure. BART is maybe one of the most egregious examples of where the goal was to create a space age fancy metro system and actually using modes properly wasn't the highest priority. If electrified bi-level commuter trains like those being used on say Caltrain were used, a lot of positive benefits could have came out of it. First of all, Caltrain could have been straight up integrated into BART. And second of all, BART wouldn't be so constrained by its existing Transbay 2, which isn't designed for a bi-level train. It's got a smaller diameter than is necessary. Of course, there's no reason bi-level EMUs can't also provide a okay off-peak service as BART does, but again, they would have enabled a higher total capacity and more daily ridership. Now there's another city in California, LA, that does a lot of weird stuff with its transit modes. The Gold Line, in particular, uses high floor LRVs, which have a maximum speed of 55 miles per hour or 90 kilometers per hour, not even as fast as highway traffic. 
The line is 50 kilometers long and has around 25 stations, which means the average station gap is 2 kilometers. If the Gold Line had have used more appropriate regional rail style rolling stock, think Ottawa O train or the Sprinter train between LA and San Diego, then service could have been operated at a higher speed and it would have been more comfortable and likely attracted more riders. The Gold Line only carries 50,000 riders every day right now. As well, the trip from Citrus College to downtown LA, well, Union Station in LA, could have been cut from around an hour to around 40 minutes, which would be a major time savings. And when you consider the fact that, again, 50,000 people ride this line every day, that's a massive economic benefit for cutting down trip times. Because the wrong mode was used on the gold line, the transit rider's experience and the quality of the line on the whole was decreased. Now, while these past three examples really do annoy me, the last example is absolutely terrible. And it's where you often see planners talking about how BRT has massive potential capacity and it could basically carry as many people as a metro if you wanted it to. This is really bad, really problematic, and here's why. One, when you want to have higher capacities on a BRT, you typically need to spend a lot more money. This means grade separation, more lanes, and bigger stations. Often bigger than you would need for a railway because you need to be able to accommodate many buses stopping at the same time. Number two, when you're adding on top of the last point, since planners seem to think that BRT can basically last you forever because the capacity is essentially infinite, not a lot of thought is put into how you could convert the line in the future into something like light rail or ideally a metro. This leads to results like what happened in Ottawa again. While I don't necessarily agree that Ottawa needed to go for a low floor train, part of the rationale was that because corners were so tight, again because they were appropriate for buses but not necessarily for trains, that you had to use something with a very tight turning radius for which LRT fit the bill. In addition, if you're not planning to eventually convert a BRT line to a rail line, you might not consider things like clearances for catenary when you do your grade separations. What this can lead to is incredibly expensive retrofits when you eventually need to convert a successful BRT to something higher order. Point three, the only way to get truly super high capacities on BRTs are with gigantic stations and with a lot of lanes, which takes up a ton of space, much more than an equivalent rail system. If you look at systems like the BRT in Guangzhou or the Transmillennial, you'll see that many areas have passing lanes. And again, as I mentioned previously, stations often allow many buses to stop at once. This blows up your station size and blows up the width of the right of way, which actually makes for a pretty bad pedestrian experience, not unlike a major highway, often dividing a community. Now to be totally clear, obviously I prefer this to an actual highway, but a rail system would be so much better and it would probably be zero emissions by default. Point four, operations and maintenance costs are super high. This is probably the worst part about BRT. Yes, it can be pretty scalable in terms of capacity, but if you truly want to go to very, very high capacities and do something like what Ottawa was doing before it had to convert to rail, you're going to need a ton of vehicles and a ton of drivers. Now, it's a simple fact that one of the things that drives costs the most when operating a transit service is the number of operators. This is why we aim for things like commuter rail and subways, which are giant vehicles that have at most one or two operators. Since buses pretty much can't get much bigger than unarticulated, at least in North America, you could go to buy articulated, but it hasn't been done in the US or Canada yet. Then what you essentially have to do to grow capacity is just add more buses. And what that means is adding more operators and doing a ton more maintenance. Buses don't last as long as rail vehicles, so that also means your cost of replacing vehicles goes up as well. This means that if planners choose BRT for an important transit line with the belief that, well, we can grow capacity in the future if we need to, what they're actually doing is dooming their transit agency in the future to super high operation and maintenance costs for the transit line, which could lead to service cutbacks or other issues. So with all of that out of the way, what should drive our decisions about mode? If the vehicle needs to travel long distances, it should be able to go fast. This applies in areas like regional rail and maybe some metro systems. If a line needs to carry a ton of riders or is expected to be frequently crowded, then a flat floor, lots of doors, and a large overall vehicle should be a priority to maximize capacity. If operating costs aren't a huge issue and you have an existing backbone transit network and you need flexibility, well, buses and light rail make a lot of sense there, but only when you truly need the flexibility. Some systems in Europe with tram trains, etc., show this off pretty well. At the end of the day, instead of choosing a mode first and then building around that, we need to say, what is the line we're trying to build, trying to achieve, and then determine the mode based on this. 
It shouldn't be that a politician wants a subway or a politician wants a tramway or a BRT or an LRT. It should be, what do we need to serve? What is the corridor like? What transit mode makes the most sense for this problem? Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.